So welcome back to the fourth programme in the Grey Matters podcast series. Uh, today we're going to be looking at the idea of Lanark and memory and I'm delighted to be joined today by David Hassan. David uh, used to be an architect and remains on the register of architects. However, about a decade ago, he gave up practising to be an academic, teaching, thinking and writing about architecture for a living. He is currently writing and drawing on the subject of connections between music, maths, literature, philosophy and architecture, and in particular, but not only in the context of cities. And at the moment, his focus is on Glasgow and the works of Alistair Gray and Edwin Morgan. So David, thanks very much for joining me here today. It's good to see you. Um, Thank you. If we can maybe sort of go back to the start, maybe in your first introduction to Lanark, um, if you could tell us a little bit about, a bit about when you first read it, um, what age you were, maybe what you were doing at the time and what impact it had on you. Ah, right. Um, I, I first read Lanark in um, 1985 when I had just completed my part two as an architecture student. Um, I was living in Canterbury, which is where I had been studying, and um, I, I was commuting to London because we, I was working um, and saving to go on a long bike trip that we'd planned, uh, my friends and I had planned. So I, I resisted reading Lanark. I was recommended it by um, a woman that I liked very much, and I read the back. And I was 25 and relatively immature, I suppose. And obviously that much of a gushing review and all the, the references, so I just came across as a bit pretentious. I thought, I don't really want to read this. But then I gave in and I bought it and I, I read it um, in a weekend. It took me a weekend to read it. I literally couldn't put it down. And I don't remember anything else about that weekend. It was summertime. I maybe felt lonely. Um, I also maybe felt homesick because... Um, my grandparents lived in Denart Street, which is literally around the corner from Find Horn, Horn Street. So everything in it seemed familiar. Being a slightly grumpy um, misfit at 25, you know, living, admittedly, I'd chosen to, to study as, somewhere as far away from Glasgow as I could get and still be in Britain, which is why I was in Canterbury. So that, there was that. Um, but I just remember being kind of overwhelmed by the variety and Sometimes the simplicity of the way Alistair used to write and, and say things, you, you, you'd have this sort of idea in your head that life was complicated and choices were complicated. And, and then the simplicity of, of Alistair, sometimes obtuse writing would, would sort of seem really surprising and beautiful. So I think that's my first impressions of, of um, Lanark. Um, yeah, that's my first reading of it was those were I, I took from it. I mean, obviously, you're saying it was over a weekend, quite an immersive experience if you're reading yes. it. Yes. Because it's, let's face it, it's not a short book, is it? So um, <laughs> you were obviously um, fully immersed in, in that first reading. And um, was it, you know, obviously, you're studying architecture, was it the kind of architecturally sort of vivid, real and imagined places that he was creating? Did they appeal to you? I mean, you're talking about so obviously the biographical elements of familiarity of places that obviously. Yeah. Had an emotional resonance with you, but this way that he constructed spaces did that kind of have a what were your thoughts? Well, about? Yes, I mean, um, architecture is, is, uh, is it has two ways you can go with it you get very abstracted and you concentrate, I suppose. I mean, to really grotesquely oversimplify, you end up focusing on the aesthetic, um, and there's a thing called non referential architecture which kind of makes that that case, um, or you can think of it as the social construct, which is how I got into architecture in the first place. And in, in, when I was 25, I was still struggling with that. I mean, about 10 years after that, I remember I was teaching architecture in a primary school and the, one of the kids said to me, when did you decide to be an architect? And I said, well, I really haven't still yet. I don't know if I want to be an architect. It was kind of like that. So it was just an, another of the, the ways of thinking about cities, you know, having been brought up in Glasgow in the 60s as a child and 70s as a you know from 10 to a teenager Glasgow was continually being de destroyed and rebuilt you know the motorways that a lot of the the places that I recognized particularly the boundary between Ridgeway and Black Hill that was all wiped out in my lifetime the canal was all gone and so on so the whole idea that of Glasgow and Unthank and returning to Unthank and then 
I think he's describing looking at Red Road and the motorways when he arrives back. All of that seemed incredibly uh, resonant to me as, as a way of trying to understand not just the fact of change, but how change acts on people, mm-hmm. which I suppose is something that I've got from Lanark. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That kind of um, yeah. mapping of the city, I guess, from a sort of social um, history yeah. point of view too. And I, I mean, I see that in some of the images I've been kind of going through here um, from, you know, from Alistair's um, Bowman from his studio, some of the photographs and sketches he was making at a similar time, almost like looks like an alien world to the Glasgow that you look out and encounter now. Um, yes. Which kind of mapping and charting of it really kind of comes through in the novel too, doesn't it? Yeah. Also, Glasgow can still be like that. Most cities can. It can be really alienating. There's, um, yeah, there's a lot of ways that people draw cities. Um, and Alistair's is very interesting, but I think that the insight that he gets turns up in, in particularly the way artists encounter cities. Mm. And what, what would you say, how, how would you say he then charts or maps Glasgow and, and Lanark, say, or, or beyond? What, what is it that he's... There are so many ways. That the, the, the one thing that, that um, is, is more to do with him as a novelist, I suppose, than a, an artist, is, it, is there's a, a shattering of it. You know, you see these psychogeographical maps in particular, um, the, where the, the city sort of divided into sections and you, you sort of leave one and enter another. So he's kind, he kind of exaggerates that. And there are elements of the way his, his Lanark's life is, I was going to say conducted, but uh, his life sort of happened more than it was conducted. But the episodes in it, they, t- they tend to have a characteristic environment surrounding them and the space. So the space, Rima's bedroom in particular, I find really fascinating. I love it. Probably one of the drawings I'll make is it was trying to reconstruct that drawing. Um, and But there are places that I, I, I kind of put in my mind, like where he arrives after um, after he's um, died as Thaw. Mm-hmm. I think that's Kelvin Bridge before it was, um, you know, the train station at the lower level under Great Western Road. And I can imagine him walking north and east up, up through that. But it's a, it's, a, it's a Kelvin Bridge that I've recovered from photographs. Um, and um, but areas that I remember. Mm. So the city, it's the fracturing of it, I think, which is is, is a lot to do with how we experience the city. Yeah, and that, um, yeah, and I guess we were talking about that, how you experience architecture, right, from a physical but an emotional, I mean, I know he, he spoke about, about that with um, writing Lanark, he didn't read, I think Glasgow Cathedral was the only physical space he went back to while he was writing. Yes. So but everything else is like conjured from, this from your imagine, you know, your imagination and your emotion, and there's lots of layers within that, isn't it? How you remember then building yeah. places and things. I'm cu- I'm, I'm inventing. I'm, I'm going to invent this, whether it's true or not. So I don't care if it's true. But there, one of the archipelags is that there's there's a, a series of books by writers called McGibbon and Ross, who were 19th century scholars who wrote um, two massive um, books. One in five volumes and the other in three volumes about architecture of Scotland up until that time. And their description in, in of Glasgow Cathedral includes a beautiful section drawing. And up in the top left is the little space under the roof where all the rooms are, where um, Alexander was born and so on. So that was all, mm. I, I don't know if Alistair Bray read McGibbon and Ross, mm. but I'm going to write and draw as if he, if that was one of his archipelags. Yeah. Um, it's the sort of thing, If I'm sure if he'd found it, he would have enjoyed it. I don't know if he did. Absolutely. And um, yeah, I wonder if we can uncover that and find out if that actually, I'm sure if we go back to maybe diaries or from that time, there must be some sort of record. Yeah. Um, can you maybe, I know you've sort of mentioned that your thesis that you were just talking briefly a, a bit about there. Could you talk a little bit about that in terms of, I know you're yeah. interested in particular about the index of plagiarism within Lanark and this sort yes. of index that you've been uh, oh. and thinking about. It'd be great to hear more about that, David. Yeah, well, well, like I said, that one in particular, I'm prepared to um, lie about because I think even if it's not true, it should be. <laughs> so there's that, and I think that's a, an approach in in some of what the way Alistair used to the jokes in in Lanark um, are like that. So I'm, I'm quite happy, but there are things which are, are clear, um, things like um, the uh, the sort of futuristic and um, mechanistic way the institute works and the idea of it taking over the world. There are things like the, the walking cities of the Archigram group and the, the graphics that they use are 
very architectonic, but you can see the reflections of it in, in some of the ways that Lanark draws. And again, I don't know how much he would have known about that, but that's why I've, I've described them as diffuse plagiarisms, because they were there in the 60s. And there are other things like the um, the Archizum group in Italy, which are very um, anti-consumerist, um, but very uh, propagandist in the way that, I mean, they're not really proposals for cities, so they're, they're proposals for ways of thinking about cities using architectural techniques. And they're very, very um, Marxist in a, in a sort of very um, anti-Marxist establishment kind of way, not Soviet um, Marxism. And their roots are in a, a lot of um, people whose lives were shattered and remade by, by the war and by fascism in Italy. So there's interesting connections. There are some drawings by Branzi, which are actually, again, um, I'm going to, I don't care about how true it is, that they seem to be after a lot of um, Lanark was written, but they are really beautifully diagrammatic using architectural conventions, but representing the way that cities consist of layers of um, servicing, if you like, so the corridors, the, the, the tubes, the way that um, the city eats itself mm. idea, the, all these things um, existed around the time mm. of Havana being generated, and some of them are a bit later, mm. but they're, they're, they're the result of the same ideas. Yeah. So that, that's what we're looking at. So there's a, 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 a way of inventing how the cities looked at um, that Lanark um, and other things that, that Gray wrote uh, have their place in a sort of diffusion of these ideas, mm. myth plant and archi plant. Yeah, it's a really fascinating idea, and particularly like as you're saying, within the list of plagiarisms, you know, say some of them were real, some of them were almost jokes, or you know, you'd yeah. go to look it up and it wouldn't be there wouldn't be anything under that listing. So I think it's that kind of using it to play around with, to, to, I guess, shining the light on. Um, other connections, other artists and writers, and, and making those embedding that work within um, yeah. a wider sort of context. And I think, you know, obviously you're bringing together uh, your own interests with starting to kind of layer that. You're saying there's some things maybe listed within that Alistair might not have been aware of, but it yes. makes sense in terms of the connections and how they kind of um, yeah. pull out from this centre point. The, the, other, the other thing is that there's a, a drawing by um, Aldo Rossi, which is a, a really a collage drawing of, of elements of, of his work in the city and I'm plagiarizing that and then there's a an image in the middle of it which is a, a, a shadowy human um, person standing in front of a window with a, a light which is a very domestic small scale and he's looking through that window at the sort of map of the city mm -hmm. so I'm plagiarizing that but I'm also plagiarizing Alistair's drawing of um, the falling star so the boy sitting in the window looking out the window so it's a different window mm -hmm. so um there's a, the fact that those two drawings which are in some ways very different mm -hmm. resonate together mm -hmm. seems to me an interesting way that it's a making a claim for diffuse plagiarism yeah. it's, it's just i'm also learning how to draw um dragon uh, alistair brie pointing but his is um i think it'll be his right arm maybe his left arm something like that is a is turning into a dragon arm so i'm, I'm, dra I'm trying to learn how to draw dragon arms mm -hmm. just for that have you got from obviously the work you're doing is there a favorite or there, there may, may be more than one place um that alistair's created within manor is there a section of it like a room or a building or an environment yeah. that resonates with you yeah the the um it's not so much the room itself, but it's a room queue, I think it's called, where he arrives after he comes through the mouth, and the views from the room. And I was thinking of, when you asked about a favourite passage, there's a passage where he's talking about how he wanted to go to such and such a city that he'd seen from that room. And he, he said, I could see it clearly. And the reply was, well, if you could see it clearly, it's in the past and it's gone now, so you can't ever go there. Mm. So yeah, that, that room and mm. the various incidents that take place around it. One of the drawings I'd like to do for the the archipelag thing is is construct that room from mm. various descriptions of it. But the idea of this viewfinder, which looks into the past mm. and into the future, um, I think is really beautiful. Yeah. And that's why I think that's my that and the dragon chamber. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just like I the whole it. idea of this gigantic creature in a tiny room that you had yeah. to yeah. crawl in. Yeah. It's so visual, isn't it? That and yeah. interesting. You're talking about the idea of the sort of windows, because I think windows and these multiple viewpoints is something like that. 
but within the visual and the literary like that you mentioned that the star picture but I'm just thinking about a lot of his portraits that he's done of friends family you know sitting in a kind of tenement room but it's often you behind it which is as interesting in that context yeah. that seascape or landscape behind it which is how he plays around with that in there what do you think about obviously Alistair and how he draws cities and his perspectives these almost quite fantastical viewpoints that he creates in some of his um, yeah, they, they're, they're fantastic. I mean, again, I'm going to be pl plagiarising what that drawing I was talking about has a large area of, of the sea. And in the Rossi drawing, it's just empty. But I love the fact that in these the drawings, although you can pick out things like the um, the fourth railway bridge, for example, sometimes it's hard to, you know, he's thinking about the coasts of Scotland and in particular the west coast of Scotland. But I love the... It's, it's interesting you say about the Gray's portraits because especially like this one it's extremely simple but when you look at them the drawings then they tend there's so many layers in them quite often as you say yeah. that there's a lot happening in them but when he does like this this drawing you know it's, it's so rich um you can spend ages studying it i almost um, find those plates easier to read when he did the color version of them because then it start you started to see um maybe yeah. the perspective and the areas a little bit um, yeah, because even, you know, that image in itself is so rich, but if you zone in into a section, it's so dense, it's almost like these Bosch, like these micro narratives happening throughout it all, that it's almost your brain can't take the whole thing in, which maybe when he had his colour, it started to bring things forward and back, the perspective that yeah. had in colour may, maybe made it a bit easier to then distill down into readable sections. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think he also, I, I don't know how he, he worked. I remember when I, I the first time I visited him, he was working at his desk and he seemed, it seemed very exact. The draw, He was making the drawing, but I, I can't imagine these drawings were just made once. He just sat down right and going to make this drawing. He must have made, read and remade them. Yeah. I'd love to see actually the sketches that he, if he did mm -hmm. do the sketches that he abandoned. Yeah, there's, there's uh, quite a few actually here in the plan chest, kind of multiple versions where he'd sometimes photocopy the same image and working it or have tracing paper sections, you know, kind of layering bits. So you've kind of got the original line, but then an, an altered version on top of it, which actually from talking to, you know, you hear about that even with words, he was doing that. It's, you'd mentioned yes. earlier, this sort of distilling down into like a purist form, not overcomplicating things, but, um, and you could see that in how he wrote and edited, but also how, how he spoke. He was almost, as he was talking, trying to edit yeah simplify as he went along which is a interesting process yes. and it's, uh, people have spoken yeah it was um it's something that in architecture you, you it's, I've, I've had this experience when you you sh i went to a it was a school little school design in, in mull mm -hmm. and i turned up and i showed them what i'd done and they all sort of looked at and said that's so simple I suppose that's why you get paid for it because they've been trying to, to plan mm -hmm. it themselves and they, well, I'm glad you realise it because making it that simple was such a lot of work, and yeah. I, I, this, the achievement in in Lanark is like that. It's a huge, complicated book, but when you pick it up, you go, "Where's the art in this?" It's it's not. You can't put your finger on it because it is so simple and evasive. I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah. It was when we're talking about that kind of simplifying, and I heard I think it was George uh, Glass was talking about this in relation to when he was studying, and Alistair was one of his tutors, and how he would edit the work that he did by um, you know, putting a bit of paper over a, a section large row and improving it um, yeah. and, or, or correcting it and then often he, Alistair would correct his correction so Rog spoke about it almost being like a map you'd have these areas that started to form up of words and others that dropped down and um, can you talk I guess we're talking about spaces but like how that connects to maybe maps as well within Lanark and mm -hmm. what you're interested yeah. in well, I was in. It's it's about connections. I, I did mention the psychogeography maps, um, which were fractured, which um, it came up when I was discussing this with Andy Campbell, who I'm doing the, these papers on. I think that that's very interesting. There's the whole other plagiarisms, which I, I don't think um, are acknowledged. And maybe again, I'm, I'm inventing this. The idea of cognitive mapping that that turns up in um, in a kind of a simplified form in Kevin Lynch's Image of the City, which is one of the sort of um, iconic texts of city um, that, that everybody who studies architecture at least hears about if doesn't actually read. But that the way that that was kind of an experiment in how people understood and navigate, navigated through the city, which as was said in, in Lanark, I think he takes that to extremes. Mm. 
the, he, he is, um, uh, that the way that the city is fractured and, and terrifying. That just that, that journey from during the air raid when he walks across to Black Hill and gets lost, so the, the bomb craters and so on that are um, alien to the city. That's, that's I think, where... He, but with, with Alistair, it goes further than that. The whole, the idea of moving from, you know, the, the different deaths that happen, the first death that, that is basically the introduction to the book where he turns up um, on a train. I, I find, I, I, one of, I hadn't actually noticed it the first time I read it, but I've noticed it a lot since, is that one of the things in the knapsack that Lanark stroke Thaw has is a compass that doesn't work. Mm. I, I was thinking, how does that even work? I've got a compass which is ancient and cracked and broken, but it still works. How do you make a compass that doesn't work? Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was um, very in insightful into the whole way that he navigates through the different cities and spaces and, and lives that mm -hmm. Lanark lives. So yeah, uh, the trying to map, trying to draw like that, the, the, the experience of a space means you have to draw more than just the, the lines of the walls and you have to be thinking about them. Which, as an architect, it, it's it's a um, it's a difficult way to bring that to design. Yeah, but obviously, so, you yeah. mentioned that Lanark is something uh, is a text that you recommend to your students, and you you know you've heard. Yeah. To you. What what is it about that? Do you think they what are you hoping that they might um, well, gain in terms of their you know field of study from reading something like Lanark? It's not just Lanark. It's the idea of narrative and the way that narrative can be fractured. And also, Lanark is a good case because it's one of these books, I think, that different people see it in different ways. I mean, Gray himself decides that you don't read it in order, so you read the prologue and so on. And I think that it, it, it's, it's one of these books that you can read in different ways. And you could be talking with someone about Lanark and think, well, yeah, it's the same book, but I never thought of it like that and so on. So there's that about the narrative of it, but there's a, it's also the, the, it, you can get very reductionist as an architect, you know, the, the, if you read the, um, the reports that led to the CDAs, the destructions of areas like Old Gorbals and um, Kirkhaddens and the disappearance of Parliamentary Road, um, these things um, don't allow for the fact that people might have lived and loved and been happy in these spaces and there was ways to save them. And I think Gray's book and other books, um, I like um, Old Men in Love for different reasons and um, especially um, Poor Things, which is much, much more um, historical, I suppose, but very much in Glasgow. Um, it's important, I think, for architects to be aware of what they're, what they're doing, what realm they're in. Yeah, I think um, that... Absolutely, I think that's something that isn't considered as the emotional impact sometimes of those places. And um, I really see that, I love looking back at the City Recorder series, you know, when Alistair did those drawings in the, in the late 70s and how some of those sites are so instantly recognisable, like around Templeton and those sort of London yeah. roads. And then others, you have to almost uh, try to imagine how, how that view could have existed because it's so different from yeah. that street or that view now. And I think that idea of, you know, it's great, you know, there's way, it'd be interesting artists, you know, every year to kind of map the city in those different ways, because I guess what they would pick up on is beyond just the physical um, sites and locations, right? It's this emotional yeah. investment or understanding of place and what it means to, to them and to other people who are experiencing it. Yeah, I think art, artists do that. I mean, uh, yeah, and I think uh, I was, there's a, a thing I, I tell my students, among, amongst other things, about reading and looking at art, for example, is that sometimes you just can't see something until it's shown to you. So, I mean, they, they, I, I tend to simplify it because they're, they're young. But if you look at the way the Impressionist painted light, mm -hmm. most people didn't even see that until it was shown to them. Or, or that's exactly, they didn't notice it until it was shown to them. Mm -hmm. So with Gray's writing and, and the drawings of the city, sometimes you don't see it until yeah. somebody like him shows it to you. And that's, I guess, yeah. one of the legacies of it, isn't it? This reimagining um, of yeah. Glasgow, which I think the ripples are still kind of felt today in terms of the kind of cultural impact that had on, on, on people yes. living and working in the city and, and beyond, really. Um, yes. So you, you've obviously, David, read Lanark many times then since you, that first um, yes. immersive reading. 
um, how many times did you, and each time you read it, is there something else you're, you, you pull from that one? It's one of two books that I reread regularly. Mm -hmm. I don't really know how many times I've read it. The other one, incidentally, is War and Peace. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting in both these books because, you know, when you first read, when I first read War and Peace, for example, 16, I was 25 and I read this. My sympathy was always with the sort of adolescent impulses, if you like, you know, interested in Prince Andre and, and Natasha and, and um, interested in Lanark as Thaw and his his um his failed love life and so on. But as you read it, you be, I, I think what's amazing about some of Lanark anyway is I'm getting I'm not old but just turned 60. And I don't think he was that old when he finished it, but the, the maturing of Lanark, if you like, the um the way that he he sought for in much the same ways he sought for love in his younger time, he sought for responsibilities. Mm. In, on his own terms, which is why he was always trying to turn them down, but he took them on. Mm -hmm. And that sort of way of, of the way that life changes as you grow older. So when I read it, I, it's, you know, I, I was aware of it when I first read it, but it wasn't the main focus of, of why, it, um, why it resonated with me. But now it is yeah. more than it. Still, it's interesting to look back on youth in mm -hmm. the way that you, can, you get that insight from that. Mm -hmm. And that it was interesting, but not so interesting because youth doesn't care about what it means to get older, really. But it was interesting to see how, how Lanark developed like that and how he rushed through it. Mm. The, the way that he, um, the way that he, I, I always found it horribly sad and depressing the way the, during the flights to the conference, for example, he, he lost a large portion of his life. Mm. But now I, I, I look back on it and you think that's actually what it looks like looking back. You know, they're just suddenly, you know, once for a while there I was, you know, super fit young man and then suddenly I'm middle-aged mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm more cautious when I ride my bike in cities and things. Yeah. It's, like, it's, it's like that looking back. It isn't like that when you're living it, obviously. Yeah. I, I find that sort of yeah. changing perspective on the book um, yeah. keeps it alive for me. Mm -hmm. Mm, that's an interesting perspective yeah that idea of uh, time right and I think probably a lot of people over the last year is a good kind of indication of that what's sort of happening <laughs> <laughs> how yes. back and we're a year on and uh, uh, yeah very strange but yeah like that kind of slowing and um, acceleration of time that he kind of use, like, uses as a sort of device within in our two really yeah. there's so uh, there's so much isn't it it's such a rich and as you said yeah. that's the beauty of it too Time you read it there's maybe something that you a, a different kind of kernel or aspect of it that resonates yes um, is this maybe a good time to ask you to read a favorite passage <laughs> okay um well it's it's funny i chose this package uh, I, uh, when i you asked me to do that video I, I decided that it would be best to read what i think of as jokes i still think the see also god you and disney is one of the funniest little additions just I, I don't know why that makes me laugh but i just like that maybe the as a as a holy trinity i think they're fantastic but um but it's one of the th I, I was interested in this passage because i always misremember it i always think he says something different from what he does say about what his complaint is about the end of his life but when the more i think about it i don't think i misinterpret i just i just sort of paraphrase it in my mind I'm not really going to tell you what you paraphrase in it, but I like this. I love this passage. Um, and it's the last passage in the book. It's just the end of it. So it goes, um, after a while, he hobbled back to the space between the monuments and sat once again on the edge of the granite slab. He was tired and chilly, but perfectly content to wait. There was nobody about, but after a while, he heard the crunch of a foot on gravel. A figure approached him wearing the black and white clothes and carrying the silver tipped staff of a chamberlain. Lanark had trouble focusing on the face under the wig. Sometimes it seemed to be Monroe, sometimes Gloopy. He said, Monroe, Gloopy? Correct, sir, said the figure, bowing respectfully. We have been sent to bestow on you an extraordinary privilege. Who sent you, said Lanark peevishly. Institute or council? I just like both. Knowledge and government are dissolving. I now represent the Ministry of Earth. Everything keeps being renamed. I've stopped caring. Don't try to explain. The figure bowed again and said, you will die tomorrow at seven minutes after noon. 
The words were almost drowned by a squawking gull turned, turning in the sky overhead, but Lanner understood them perfectly. Like a mother's fall in a narrow lobby, like a policeman's hand on his shoulder, he had known or expected this all his life. A roaring like a terrified crowd filled his ears. He whispered, death is not a privilege. The privilege is knowing when, but I, I seem to remember passing through several deaths. They were rehearsals. After the next death, nothing personal will remain of you. Will it hurt? Not much. Just now there is no feeling in your left arm. You can't move it. In a moment it will get better again, but at five minutes after noon tomorrow, your whole body will become like that. For two minutes you will be able to see and think, but not move or speak. That will be the worst time. You will be dead when it stops. Lanark scowled with self-pity and annoyance. The Chamberlain said respectfully, Have you a complaint? I ought to have more love before I die. I've not had enough. That is everyone's complaint. You can appeal against the death sentence if you have something better to do. If you're hinting that I should go, on, go in for more adventures, no, thank you. I don't want them. But how will my son, how will the world manage when I'm not here? The Chamberlain shrugged and spread his hands. Well, go away, go away, said Lennart more kindly. You can tell the earth I would have preferred a less common end, like being struck by lightning. But I'm prepared to take death as it comes. The Chamberlain vanished. Lanark forgot him, propped his chin on his hands and sat a long time watching the moving clouds. He was a slightly worried, ordinary old man, but glad to see the light in the sky. I think that's a great way to end the book. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Absolutely. Mm. And then the little section below it that he added, right, about the maps to his... Yes. Yeah, yeah I, thought about, I thought about reading that bit, but I, just, I think that note, that's a long, because there's that long gap. Yeah. I think you sit silently and then you read that. Yeah. Yeah. And yes, they are, it is a good way to end too. It really is. I cannot move, it's time to go, yes. But yeah. I like that, that, just that slightly worried old man. <laughs> I think that's possibly autobiographical. Yes. Mm. David, it's great to talk to you for um, some of the projects you've been talking about. Can you tell us a little bit more about if some of that will be shared or how maybe people could access a little bit more about some of the things you were talking about your work well, I haven't thought very much about how it will be shared. It's a proposal for a paper at the next Alistair Gray conference, not the one that's happening in April. We were too late for that yeah. for next year. But I would be looking to publish it somewhere. Um, there's there's several um, architectural, quite specialised publications that talk about uh, writing and architecture, and mm -hmm. literature, specifically literature and architecture. So I'll be looking around for that. The, the drawings I'll, I'll try and share on, online. Um, uh, they're they're um, taking me longer than I thought. They're, it's hard to draw a scale, a, a dragon arm that, that looks like a human arm. <laughs> um, I don't, did, did, did um, Alistair actually draw that? Mm, do you know, I can maybe have a look. I think when he did, uh, you know, he did a storyboard for the film for Lanark and he drew Yes, seven. I know you do that, yeah. Yeah, I think there might be one or two very, I mean, they're small scale, but um, um, ink, yeah. you know, black pen kind of drawings, but I think there might be a few I can sort of dig out and and show you. It's one of these you know, those classical drawings where somebody's pointing at something in the drawing and I'm, I'm plagiarising that portrait yeah. of Alistair yeah. and then so his arm will be um, and there'll be a bit of gold leaf on it just because mm. I fancy using gold leaf I've never yeah. done it before. Um, so yeah it, it's, it's going to be something like that um, and, and Andy's also doing some drawings we, we talked about Andy had a nice idea for you know there's that long road mm -hmm. that's in in um, in uh, Alistair's drawing of the elite cafe. I always think of that as Parliamentary Road, mm -hmm. at least in part because that road has completely disappeared and was such a big um, part of Glasgow. My dad mm -hmm. used to talk about it. It was quite a lively road. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, well, fascinating. Look forward to um, finding out more and to yeah, sharing the um, proposal that you're working on, but also some of the images that you've been talking about, which sound great too. So. I guess people, we can make links in the future and kind of make connections, right, if, if people are interested in finding out more about what you've been working on, some of the ideas that you've discussed today. But um, yeah. thanks so much, David, for an interesting insight. Um, I really appreciate yeah. you sharing your, your thoughts on Lanark today. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs>
I've always felt that stories and pictures were a way of keeping people I knew alive and as they were. <laughs>